hey everybody so to me it seems like everybody's talking about ai uh, but that's because the curation algorithms know that that's what i'm interested in so you know my my youtube homepage and uh, my twitter feed and my well not so much my instagram feed that's still all art and pretty people but uh, the places that I go for news, you know, it's just all chock full of AI stuff. Is everybody really talking about AI? Probably not. <laughs> if I were to go up and, uh, you know, just plant myself outside of Walmart and just ask every fifth person who walks by, hey, do you know that GPT-4 is out? I think I would get a lot of blank stares. Although I think a lot of people would surprise me by saying, oh yeah, and then they describe to me, you know, uh, what, what they've done with it or, you know, what project they've made using it. That would probably be like one in three, 400 people, but I don't know. That's a guess. That's a guess because the curation algorithm algorithms distort our view of the world by showing us things that it knows we're interested in. And why does it show us things that it knows we're interested in? Cause it's, it's tasked with keeping us engaged with whatever platform it's, you know, working to keep us on, be it YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, for those of you still on Facebook, I know most everybody's on Facebook. I'm, I'm in the minority and that I didn't walk away. I didn't quit. They kicked me out and I, you know, didn't, uh, didn't abase myself sufficiently to, you know, be allowed entry or re-entry. So I was just listening to a short podcast, um, Cold Takes with, and I forget the name of the podcaster, but it's good stuff. It's all about AI. And he's talking about messages that are good to spread and messages that are probably not so good to spread about AI. And one of the, the messages that he says is not good to spread is the idea that we, whoever we are, you know, in my case, I would guess the United States, but whatever, we need to develop strong AI as quickly as possible because our rivals, if they beat us to it, are going to just, you know, they're going to rule the earth and rub our noses in our own shit. And we have to avoid that. And, you know, that, that mentality dovetails nicely with the geopolitical tensions with China and with Russia. Now, I don't see much possibility that Russia is going to, you know, be the first to get strong artificial general intelligence. China, on the other hand, quite possibly, maybe even probably. So this podcaster's message, and I really should know his name here, I'll put it up on screen. His message is that, you know, it's, it's really dangerous to overplay that angle because the best possible outcome or the best path forward is for everybody to agree that this shit is dangerous. He didn't say shit. I said shit. This is an aside. I've noticed that channels that I've been watching for a long time that used to swear freely now are bleeping out their swears like Red Letter Media. Red Letter Media can't say shit anymore. I guess the algorithm's cracking down on profanity. Bad, bad, potty mouth, <laughs> you know. Uh, Sam Altman of uh, OpenAI on the Lex Friedman podcast, uh, one thing he said that I really enjoyed, he said, I don't like being scolded by software. <laughs> I don't like being chided by a computer. You know, it's, it's aggravating. It really is aggravating. I totally agree. So messages about AI and geopolitical uh, contests and arms races. Um, you know, a, an active, hostile arms race with another emerging power, like China, um, could drive both sides to implement all manner of just half-baked silliness that has intensely dangerous side effects, or even primary effects, uh, because they're afraid the other side's going to get there first. And, you know, right now... Um, GPT-4 is powering Bing, the search engine for Microsoft, and Google is doing their best to, you know, put Lambda, or what do they call it, uh, BARD, I've actually been testing BARD, uh, to, you know, to find some application for their large language models, you know, some commercial application, put it into products. Uh, Adobe is going to be putting it into all their products, which I think is probably the best use of this stuff, because uh, Adobe products, you know, they're like, sitting down in a 747 or something, there's just so many controls, so many possibilities, so many things to do that it's easy just to 
either stare at it for a minute and get paralyzed and say, I could never learn that. Or if you're like me and I, you know, learned it back in the mid nineties to just keep using the bits that I've known how to use for 20 years and not learn any of the new stuff. And they're always putting new stuff, you know, into their software. So what I, I guess I wanted to talk about, I didn't like make notes or anything before I started jabbering here, but I have seen people like somebody sent me a link to Tim Poole ranting about the dangers of AI and how AI is going to take over everything. And he had clearly read one thing about GPT-4 and he focused in on a couple of things that sounded really dangerous, like that the GPT-4 uh, was, it was demonstrating power seeking behavior. You know, it knew that in order to achieve its goals, whatever goals were given to it, it's better to have some sort of power. You know, that could be political power, financial power, social power, you know, power to get people or make people do the things that will facilitate the achievement of its goal. He didn't say it like that, though. I mean, he said it in a very alarmist fashion and, you know, basically just doom scrolling, you know, in, in a free form rant. He's a very talented guy, you know, and he's really good at just filling dead air uh, with with no notes, you know. Uh, but he's also alarmist. And, you know, alarmism, it gets clicks. Doomerism gets clicks. Uh, you know, somebody saying, hey, the situation is complicated and whatever, you know, vivid scenario or, or visual hook leaps to mind and grabs your attention, let it go. It's probably distracting you for something, from something more useful, more interesting, but more nuanced and uh, not as easily attributable, you know, to one faction or another. And I guess that's the other thing, you know, the, the geopolitical tensions is, is one factor driving AI, but another sort of tension is the social tension, the factional tension here in the United States, it's between the red tribe and the blue tribe. And I think that's generally true, you know, in the English speaking world, uh, the different, the red tribe and the blue tribe have different names in the UK or Australia or New Zealand or Canada. Um, but it's pretty much the same dynamic everywhere. I mean, you know, the so-called left here in the United States is further right than the right in other, some of those other countries, but you know, so it goes. But I wonder, like, I'm guessing that AI is not, you know, just all over everybody's feeds and screens right now, uh, the way it is mine, because as far as I know, the two factions haven't hardened into diametrically opposed positions on the topic of AI. And when AI really is everywhere, that will happen immediately, the way it did with COVID, you know? Um, neither side was scientific. I mean, the, the blue tribe you know, they stroke themselves thinking of just how, how scientifically literate they were. And, you know, as somebody who spent years reading the philosophy of science and, you know, how science works, how different ideas compete with one another in order to uh, either maintain or overthrow a current paradigm, I didn't see any, I was never, never impressed by any blue tribers sanctimonious notions about how they respect the science. In fact, whenever you say the science, I know that your brain is full of pseudoscience. Um, the red tribe, I mean, yeah, you had people on the red team too, who thought with a few Google searches, they, they were expert, you know, immunologists or, um, what do you call people who study pandemic disease, put it on screen, but epidemiologists, I saw a lot more of that coming from the left and a lot more just self preening, self congratulatory stroking from the folks on the left who thought that, you know, they had science on their side. The fuck you did. <laughs> you, the two factions, it could have flipped. It could have gone the other way. It could have been the red tribe that was, you know, hyper, hyper risk averse and demanding that, you know, people's rights be trampled on in the, the name of safety. And it could have been the blue tribe. It, it, it's a stretch. I mean, if, if you're 17 and all you know of the blue tribe is what you've seen in the last 10 years, then it seems implausible for me to say that once upon a time, like when I was a teenager, and we didn't talk about red and blue tribes, but, you know, generally the, the people that you would have thought of as the blue tribe, they were in favor of human rights. They were in favor of civil liberties, like the American civil liberty union 
the ACLU, they, in the past, they protected the rights of Klansmen and Nazis to march, you know, because it was a matter of freedom of speech, and they were there to protect civil liberties, including the freedom of speech, no matter whose freedom of speech was at risk or was being curtailed. It was the right, you know, it was the principle that they were defending, not a particular faction. Now that's completely gone. Now the ACLU, the, you know, Southern Poverty Law Center, all of these great institutions from the latter half of the 20th century that, you know, really used to be focused on defending people are now just pitting the two tribes against each other, stroking the blue team, you know, making them feel self-important, uh, demonizing the red faction, you know, insisting that everybody who isn't woke is racist, putting out hit lists. It wasn't a hit list exactly. I might remove that. Uh, but basically making lists of bad actors and then releasing them publicly so the, you know, with, with the absolute sure knowledge that that will imperil the people on the list. Anyway, my question is, I mean, that, that, was, that was all an aside. That was all a fuck the culture war aside, but mostly the blue team because the red team have always been idiots and I didn't really, <laughs> I've never been disappointed with them because I never, never, you know, thought highly of them to start with. But the question now is, when this is on the tip of everybody's tongue, which it surely will be within a few months, which side is going to take which position? I could well imagine Team Red being sold by the geopolitical pressure arms race argument, yes, we, we can't let China get there first. We absolutely have to go full steam ahead to develop strong general AI. Although... I, I'm not even sure that the, the differences between narrow and general AI are really going to penetrate the mainstream conversation very effectively. Um, maybe they will. And if they already have, and you can you know, post a link and demonstrate to me that there are actually nuanced conversations about these topics taking place in fairly mainstream outlets, I'd be interested. I would be interested to know that. Um, Something I haven't really been doing, I mean, I, I start to do it and then I get sidetracked or I just get bogged down because it's not easy enough yet, is to use AI tools to do the things I need to do anyway, which is to schedule podcasts, record them, edit them, write descriptions of them, create art based. Now, I've been creating art, you know, I've been using, um, uh, what is it called? Night Cafe AI, which is a web based um, platform they use various types of stable diffusion models and also DALI to create images. I've been using that, but really there's a lot of other AI, you know, stuff, AI tools that are available for podcasters, which, you know, I've started to use and I just get frustrated because they don't work well enough. Like today I used Otter AI to create a transcript of my conversation with Brian Chong, at least the first part of it, the one that was in KMO show episode number five. And the transcript, I mean, it's amazing that it can create a transcript. It's amazing. But it fucking sucks because it's such shit. There's so many errors. It can't paragraph. It can't tell who's talking. Proper nouns. I mean, it, it doesn't recognize GPT-4. <laughs> Imagine having a conversation. Imagine an AI trying to make a transcript of a conversation two people talking about AI today and you know, the algorithm doesn't know what to make of the syllables GPT-4. So these tools are simultaneously amazing and hugely frustrating. And I'm reminded of a party that I went to in Seattle, probably in the year 2001. Okay, I went on a long rant there that I'm going to cut out and uh, just say, thanks for watching. <laughs> like and subscribe, blah, blah, blah. Uh, more important than that, though, is comment. And let me know. Just looking at the front page of your, your, however you take in YouTube, you know, the main videos that the curation algorithm is offering you, what is the most important thing in your world, according to YouTube? That I'm very interested in hearing, so, or reading. <laughs> Thanks again. Talk to you soon. Stay well.